All right, good. All right, let's see. A few other things to mention. You have a quiz due on Wednesday. If you're in the online section, you have two quizzes due on Wednesday. But the in-person section, you have lecture quiz four is due. Well, um, online folks, you have lecture quiz four and lab quiz five, I believe it is. Um, they're due by midnight on Wednesday, so make sure you get those done. Uh, we are having a Wildlife Society meeting on Wednesday, as usual. So if you want to come to that, you should be there. It's a good opportunity. Next week, I'll be posting the lecture exam to Moodle. You'll have a week to take it from the time that it's posted. Um, so just make sure you're aware of that. We'll have a little bit of review next week in here about it. Uh, I'll be posting a quiz on Wednesday of this week. That quiz will include whatever we cover this week in lecture, uh, as well as chapter 24 from your book. So make sure you read chapter 24 for your lecture quiz. Uh, that'll be posted on this Wednesday. I, I told you all about that last week, but just a reminder, make sure you read chapter 24. My mouse is MIA today, so I'm just using the computer mouse. Let's see what else. Oh, your uh, your paper. You have something due tonight. Your topic sheet is due tonight. By midnight on Moodle, there is a submission page. Go to Moodle and submit your paper by midnight, your topic sheet by midnight tonight. Remember, there's a format for that. You need to cite sources. Um, you know, go back through your document there. If you have any questions, that's all on Moodle. Uh, any other questions, you can email me. Um, but like I said, that's due at midnight tonight, so make sure you get that in. If you're in the online section and you still have not picked a topic, well, your grade has been severely impacted. So pick a topic immediately. Get that done. <clears throat> Everybody in person picked their topic long ago. So you guys are all on top of things. <clears throat> so today and uh, Wednesday as well, we're going to uh, cover one PowerPoint. It's uh, lecture seven. We're just going to, it's going to be an introduction to some ecology. So we're just going to talk about some ecological concepts. Um, these lectures might not last the entire time. They might, but um, I have a feeling we'll get out just a couple minutes early. Uh, today and Wednesday, probably. But both both these lectures are going to come from this PowerPoint. So we cover the first half of the day and the second half on Wednesday. It's just too much to do in one day. All right, ecosystems and natural communities. Uh, let's start with a, with a quote from Aldo Leopold. Civilization is a state of mutual and interdependent cooperation between humans, i.e. human animals, other animals, plants, soils, uh, which may be disrupted at any moment by the failure of any one of them. So in other words, we're all connected, the plants, the animals, the soil, the humans, and a disruption of any one of those things could cause a major collapse of the ecosystem. And along those lines, let's define ecosystems. So ecosystems don't just include plants and animals, they also include air, soil, and water. <clears throat> so often when we talk about ecosystems, we talk about something called SWAPA. I've already warned y'all, we like our acronyms in natural resource management. So SWAPA is soil, water, air, plants, and animals. That's what make up an ecosystem. SWAPA, soil, water, air, plants, and animals. Commit that to memory. You'll hear people say SWAPA a lot. <clears throat> The living parts of an ecosystem are called the biotic community. You might know what the non-living parts of an ecosystem are called? Yeah, abiotic factors. The abiotic factors are the non-living parts. The living parts are the biotic community. And let me give you a definition for ecosystem. So within ecosystems, living organisms function as a unit. They are a community of living things a dynamic complex of plant, animal, and microorganism communities. 
So an ecosystem is a, a place where living portions of the environment interact with their physical environment and the non-living components and that forms an ecosystem. So if I asked you for the definition of an ecosystem, you would say living portions of an environment that interact with the physical environment and the non-living components. You could make it more technical. You could say the biotic portions of an environment that interact with the abiotic portions of the environment. That would be fine too, if you wanted to simplify it. <clears throat> Virtually all ecosystems have been modified somehow by humans. We have on pretty much every ecosystem on the planet, we've done some sort of modification. We've done something. There's no ecosystem or piece of land out there that humans haven't touched. That's why the idea of, well, just let nature handle it doesn't work because there's there's no it's too late for that we've already messed up everything on the planet you break it you buy it it's ours now we got to be responsible for it so all ecosystems have been modified by one or more of these activities and there's probably some others that aren't even listed here but mineral and energy extraction urban development livestock production impoundment and diversion of water waste disposal forestry, agriculture. We could add climate change to this list. We could add uh, litter and pollution to this list. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that we could add to this list. But in other words, just remember that everywhere on the planet has been modified in one way or another by humans. Here we've got another definition for niche. A niche emphasizes the function within an ecosystem, usually the function of an organism within an ecosystem. And in fact, the definition of a niche is the specific role that an organism plays in its ecosystem. <clears throat> so insectivore, something that eats insects. That's a role, that's a niche that an animal plays. Herbivore, something that's eaten the plant community, grazer or browser or a fish that uh, that builds some sort of uh, um, some sort of structure in the stream to lay its eggs in or just a fish that lives in the stream and eats food and produces nutrients for the stream. All of that, those are all niches. Just a, it's just whatever your function is in the ecosystem, that's your niche. Plants and animals survive so long as they can compete successfully for food, water, cover, and space. <clears throat> when we talk about niches, there are specialist niches. So specialists would be uh, creatures or animals that require very specific habitat types with little or no room for dealing with change or for colonizing different habitats. We'll talk about some examples in a minute. But a specialist is something that needs a very specific habitat. Versus a generalist that could deal with a broader set of environmental conditions. Think about white-tailed deer. They can be just about anywhere. They don't need very specific habitat requirements. In fact, a better example would be a cougar or a mountain lion or a puma concolor, puma, panther, whatever you want to call it, all names for the same animal. Uh, the cougar is one of the most widespread mammals on the planet, or at least historically they were. You can see where their historic range is uh, in the, the greenish, or I'm sorry, in the, in the tan color here on our screen. So the big uh, eastern United States, all the way to the western. You can see the northern part of the, can of the range was about halfway up Canada. They extend down into South America. They actually go all the way down to the, the tip of South America. Panthers are one of the most widespread uh, animals or mammals, particularly in North America. Males have a home range of 200 square miles, over 200 square miles. So they can, just an individual can move a lot. They have a big home range. Um, you can see the shrinking range of the, of the cougar. Uh, the tan again is where they used to be. The green is where they are now. So they're in the West. They're not here in the east. There's a little patch there in Florida. 
Uh, sometimes we do get um, vagrants that will wander to the east, uh, but there are no populations here in the east besides that one in the Florida panhandle. We can get, we'll get into cougars at some point, but there's a lot of people that claim they see cougars here in North Carolina. We don't have mountain lions here. You didn't see a mountain lion. You saw a big dog more than likely or a bobcat or something else, but it probably wasn't a mountain lion. <clears throat> Specialist would be something like the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is not likely extinct. Is is It's extinct. Although people are debating and saying, oh, I saw one in Florida. Take a picture. If you ever see an endangered species or something that someone says is extinct, take a picture. You see a cougar here in the eastern United States, take a daggone picture. Then I'll believe you. Otherwise, I don't believe you. You didn't see a cougar and you definitely didn't see an Iverville woodpecker. Bring a picture. It's 2022. We've all got cameras in our pockets. Take a picture. Anyway, Iverville wood woodpeckers had very specific habitat requirements. They required mature, swampy, river rain forests. And by mature, I mean old, old trees. We're talking at least 100-year-old trees. Uh, breeding pairs required three squares miles of undisturbed swamp. That's a lot. So that's a big area for a bird. And uh, to leave that area undisturbed just didn't happen. We just didn't do that, particularly in the place where I rebuild woodpeckers lived, which was in the lower Mississippi alluvial valley, uh, as well as along some of the southeastern coast and down into Cuba. Uh, but they, this specific habitat requirements that the Iverbill woodpecker has restricted it to that range. And it's a relatively small range, especially when we compare it to a cougar at a massive range. This is a pretty small range. Uh, and what happened here in the southeast is we pretty much logged out all our mature bottomland hardwood forests. We took all those giant trees and used them for making uh, sewing uh, machine cases, as a matter of fact. For a lot of these, this... Uh, particularly down in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, what we call the Singer Track, Singer Sewing Machines, were all made from the wood out of that track, which was the last place that I rebuild woodpeckers existed <clears throat> until it was completely logged out. Now they're not there anymore. So if you got a specific habitat requirement, you are vulnerable. It's easier as a species to wipe you out if you need something specific. It's harder to wipe out deer, right? They could be anywhere doesn't matter we can run a thousand over of, of them over a day with a car and it won't make a dent in their population but something like an ivory bill woodpecker that needs this specific thing you all you got to do is take away that thing and then they're done that's all it takes <clears throat> so a little bit further into niches let's look at the spruce grouse and the rough grouse so these are two very similar species they're in the same family i I think they're even in the same genus, but they have different ranges. The spruce grouse lives much farther north where it's much colder and there's different plant communities. The rough grouse also lives pretty far north. So how do they compete? How do they live in the same place? Because they're very similar looking birds. They have very similar habits, but the spruce grouse has a winter diet that is composed almost entirely of needles from the jack pine. Therefore, a large part of what the spruce grouse is eating, especially in the winter, is going to be jack pine. That's their feeding niche, their winter feeding niche. Spruce grouse depend on jack pine. Even where jack pine is not as prevalent, the winter diet is usually coniferous trees. So if there's not jack pine, they'll just eat spruce or fir or some other pine tree needles. But the rough grouse has a winter diet that's almost entirely buds of deciduous trees. So the spruce grouse is associated with sites that are dominated by pines and spruce while the rough grouse is found in sites that are dominated by deciduous trees. So their ranges overlap, but they have different niches. They eat different things. They can exist in the same place and not compete each other. Even though both occupy the same forest, the feeding niche is separate. 
So competition for winter food resources is thereby minimized. The ability to match habitats to the niche requirements of a species is a fundamental importance of wildlife management. Makes sense, right? We need to understand what the animals need in order to give them what they need. Altered habitats often lack some of the resources needed for the maintenance of a niche. In other words, whenever we humans do something to a habitat, we typically alter something that was needed for an animal's niche. And we don't necessarily understand all the intricacies and details that go with every animal animal's niche. So there may be something like this bird eats this little insect and this little insect eats this little plant. And well, this little plant we consider a weed. So I, we wiped out this little plant, which means the insect wiped out, which means the bird that ate that insect is also wiped out. <clears throat> Uh, niches are of particular concern when we talk about exotic species because, and this is a hard and fast rule, write this, commit this to memory for the rest of your life. This is an ecological principle. No two species can occupy the same niche. When two species try to occupy the same niche, niche competition will happen and one of them will be displaced. In other words, one species will win the competition and the other one will have to leave. That's the way it works. No two species will occupy the same niche. If one tries to occupy the same niche, then the other has to disappear. That's why invasive species are such a big deal. Because when you release an invasive species like kudzu, it takes over an area. And only kudzu can exist in that niche. So whatever other creeping vine we would have had here can't do that. And in fact, kudzu, you know, grows so pro proficiently. It grows a foot a day in the summer. It just takes over everything. No plants can compete with it. So why don't they just adapt? Why have white-tailed deer populations thrived in suburban environments? Because they adapted. White-tailed deer are very adaptable. They live just about anywhere. Why does exotic royal polonia introduce the United States from China as an ornamental, but able to escape from cultivation and thrive in vacant land along roadsides in the U.S.? Because it's adaptable. It likes open field areas, and it doesn't care what type of soil it's in, and it doesn't really necessarily care that much about the climate. So it can be in a whole bunch of different places other than where it was originally evolved. Coyotes, same deal, symbol of the West. They've successfully occupied the East. Well, we eliminated red wolves. That means there was an open niche. So coyotes just walked on over. We built a bunch of bridges across the Mississippi River. It's pretty easy for them to just walk across a bridge, be here. There's no wolves to compete with them anymore. They fill a niche. Ringneck pheasants, originally from China, thrive in the northern and midwestern United States. That's because it's a very similar, there's a lot of similar niches, especially in the United States to Asia. That's why a lot of our invasive species are Asian descent, because we have very similar habitats. Answers to all these questions relate to the adaptability, adaptive ability of all these species. So what is an adaptation? An adaptation, here's a definition in red, is any physiological or morphological feature or form of behavior used to explain the ability of an organism to live where it does. So any feature or behavior that helps an organism survive where it lives is an adaptation. In any given population of any animal, of any species, some animals are going to die early in life. Right, Some things are going to die young. Some animals will live to maturity but fail to reproduce. Some will reproduce and leave beside, behind various numbers of offspring. Right, That's common sense. In any given population, some are going to die young. Some are going to live to old age and not have children. Some are going to reproduce prolifically or just a little bit. Right, Variation. The fate of an individual hinges on genetically determined characteristics that enable them to cope with the physical and biological environment. 
In other words, they're adaptations. In fact, we'll go further on adaptation. And, um, and so this is two different definitions for the same word. In that case, I would take either definition, right? Or any components from the definition. So an adaptation could also be any heritable, behavioral, morphological, or physiological trait that maintains or increases the fitness of an organism under a given set of environmental conditions. That's just a complicated way to say the exact same thing. But fitness is another important term to get into your brain. Fitness is measured by the contribution an animal makes to future generations. It's got nothing to do with health. It's got nothing to do with I got a bunch of muscles and I can run really far. Yeah, that's fit in one sense of the word, but that's not what we're talking about here. Fitness is the animal's ability to contribute to future generations. In other words, make offspring. That is an animal's fitness. Who's, who contributes most to the population's gene pool? That's the most fit individual. And this is more than just a number game. So think of it this way. Individual A produces four offspring. Well, individual B only produces two offspring. Is A more fit than B? Maybe. If only one of, of offspring of individual A reproduces and both offspring of individual B reproduce, then individual B has contributed proportionally more to the next generation than individual A. And individual B is actually more fit. So it's not just about how many babies you can make, but it's how many babies your babies can make as well. That is all has to do with your fitness. So in this case, B would actually be the more fit animal because it was able to produce, contribute more to future generations. Its genetics are more prevalent in the population than species A. Therefore, it was more fit. It is more fit. Organisms live within a range of tolerance. That's the conditions that make survival possible for that particular species. Species with similar ranges of tolerance uh, form communities within ecosystems. So like Arctic hare, snowy owl, polar bear. That's part of a community. It's part of the Arctic community. Black bear, great horned owl, um, Cottontail rabbit. It's more of an Appalachian community than a tundra community, right? <clears throat> and animals are typically built for their environment. They've adapted to their environments. Uh, a good example would be these two owls here that are in the same genus, Bubo. Uh, we've got Great Horned Owl and Snowy Owl. They're very closely related. Um, but they're built for their environment. They have some adaptations. The great horned owl is found in the lower United States, well, below Canada. Um, and the snowy owl is found from Canada on up, found in the tundra and snowy places. They'll come down here in the winter when they migrate, but that's where they live and breed is up north in the Arctic or in the tundra, not the Arctic. Um, so you can imagine there's a lot of snow on the ground where snowy owls live. And if you're an owl, you hunt little rodents on the ground. So a snowy owl has to stick its feet in the snow to get its prey. Because of that, they have feathers on their feet. Great horned owls don't have to do that as much. Not a big a deal that they have feathers on their feet. So they don't. So a snowy owl can tolerate far colder temperatures than a great horned owl can because it's adapted to. Reindeer or caribou, same animal. Both the male and females grow antlers. They're the only cervid that both male and females grow antlers. And, is, and their antlers have this weird shovel thing on the front. That is because they also live in the tundra 
where the ground is frozen and covered in snow for most of the year. So they use that shovel basically on the front of their antlers to move the snow out of the way and get down to the tundra grass underneath the snow. By the way, male, ant male reindeer uh, shed their antlers in November. Female reindeer keep their antlers through January. You know what that means? Santa's reindeer are all female. They got boys' names, but they're all ladies. Something to keep in mind. Because they've all got antlers, right? Only males have antlers in December. Thermal gradient. Animals show different forms or qualities along gradients from Arctic to tropical. So in other words, animals change the way they look and appear as they go from Arctic climates down to tropical climates. And there are some technical terms for that, for ranges of tolerance. And we, uh, we use Latin for a lot of things. And often we're using Latin for prefixes of words. So here's a couple prefixes to get into your brain. Steno means narrow and uri means wide. So white-tailed deer are uri thermal, meaning they have a wide range of tolerance for temperature. They occur from Canada all the way down to Venezuela. It's a lot hotter in Venezuela than it is in Canada. I can promise you that. They can tolerate all the temperatures from one in between. One of you might not be able to take an individual from Canada and plop it down in Venezuela and it'd be okay. But white-tailed deers can live from Canada all the way down through Venezuela. Polar bears, on the other hand, are stenothermal. In other words, they have a narrow range of tolerance. They're only found in the Arctic. If I took a polar bear and plopped him down in Venezuela, it would not survive. <clears throat> this becomes really important when we start talking about introducing animals to ecosystems. If you're a wildlife manager, there may be a time where you're managing a refuge and people say, we want to introduce an animal to this refuge. That may be a good thing if you're trying to reintroduce something that was here previously and you're trying to bring it back. Maybe that's good. Maybe you're trying to bring in something for hunting opportunities, which is the example we're going to look at. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Maybe you're bringing in an invasive species and it's definitely bad. Just depends. In the 40s, willow ptarmigan were released into Michigan. The folks that released the willow ptarmigans into Michigan were not paying attention to the ptarmigan's range of tolerance. Uh, the willow ptarmigan would have been present in Michigan long before mankind if it had been a suitable environment within their range of tolerance. We're going to look at their range map here in a minute. They could have gotten down to Michigan if they wanted to be there, but they weren't there, and there's a reason. The range of tolerance establishes the limits of geographical distribution for every species, except where physical barriers prevent their spread. So in other words, there might be species that are well enough adapted that they could live in Africa and the United States, but they got across the Atlantic Ocean to get to Africa, and so they didn't. So there's a physical barrier that kept them from spreading into that range. No such barrier existed for willow ptarmigan. You see their range is up in the far north of Canada. If they wanted to come down here, they could make their way down here, easy enough. But their, their range is nowhere near Michigan. So introductions of the willow ptarmigan into Michigan failed miserably. The gray partridge, uh, is adapted to certain precipitation and temperature levels. Mm -hmm. And something that can be done to understand what you know temperature and precipitation an animal needs or is adapted to is called a climograph. <clears throat> Basically, we just look at an animal, its range, what are the climate factors of that range, and that's what we say is the climograph for that species. That species can exist anywhere those climatic factors 
exist as well. Gray partridges were released into Missouri and Montana, but only Montana's release was successful. Gray partridges are from Europe. Optimal climatic conditions in their native range, which was in Europe, is similar to what's found in Montana. But it's not very similar to what is found in Missouri during May and September. So May through September, it gets hot in Missouri. It doesn't usually get hot where the gray partridge is from in Europe. So they can't handle that heat all that much. Montana stays a little bit cooler than Missouri. <clears throat> so they can handle that better. And there's a gray partridge. We already covered gray partridge in uh, in lab, so you know what a gray partridge looks like at this point. And that's where we're going to end for today. So I told you we'd get out a little bit early, and we are. Uh, and then on uh, Wednesday, we're going to start population ecology. We'll start talking about sex ratios, mating systems, things like that. Um, that will also probably be a short presentation. It's it'll be even less slides than what we went through today. So um, make sure you get that paper done or that the intro. Uh, what is it? The topic sheet for your paper done. Submitted by midnight tonight. If you have questions about that or anything, email me. My office hours start right now, so you're welcome to come talk to me in my office as well. I'll be there for a couple of hours. Uh, otherwise, y'all have a great afternoon, and I'll see you on Wednesday.